Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Jennifer Wakefield. I'm the president and CEO of the Greater Richmond Partnership, and we are so pleased that you are here for our investor forum. We have these events on a regular basis to keep you up to date with the work of the Greater Richmond Partnership and our vision to become the top mid-sized location in the U.S. for companies to invest. Today's event gathers experts who specialize in marketing communities, analyzing communities, and leading economic development organizations. We are pleased to have with us today, Julie Curtin, the president of Development Counselors International, also known as DCI. They are a marketing firm specializing in working with communities, both from an economic development and tourism perspective. Thank you for joining us today, Julie. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris Lloyd, senior vice president and director of infrastructure and economic development for McGuire Woods Consulting. Many of us know Chris as he is local to us here in RVA, but he is among an elite group of international site location consultants known as the Site Selectors Guild. In his role, he advises corporate clients on which locations make the most sense for them, so his insights are especially valuable to us today. And last but certainly not least, we have with us Stephen Murray, President and CEO of the Virginia Economic Development Partnership, known as VEDP. They are a state-level economic development organization promoting the Commonwealth as the best state for business to locate. Stephen will share with us his perspective on what we need to do as a state and as a region to get into the consideration set for businesses more often. In addition, today's event will be moderated by GRP Board Chair Leslie Haley, Chesterfield County Supervisor. We will be hosting a Q&A at the end, so please put your questions in the Q&A box and they will be addressed later in the program. Now I'd like to turn today's program over to Leslie Haley. Thank you, good morning and thank you, Jennifer. I'm pleased to be here today to participate in today's discussion with our experts so we can learn what we need to do to get Richmond on the short list for consideration more often. In 2018, GRP conducted quantitative perception research with DCI. And at that time, many of us are surprised to hear that the Richmond region wasn't really on the radar of most business executives. After all, those of us who live here know what a terrific market it is for business and are often taken aback when others are as, are un, are as unaware of our region as many and the many advantages we have. A lot has happened since then. Richmond has gained a number of new accolades for our unique dining options, our art scene, our outdoor lifestyle, but has it tipped the scales for the corporate executives that GRP is really aiming to influence? So before we get into today's discussion, I'm gonna ask Julie to lead us through the new perception research and compare the results with those from 2018. Julie. Excellent, thank you, Leslie. And good morning to everyone. Nice to, nice, nice to see you today. Um, conducting perception surveys like this is an important exercise. So I'm really glad that the Richmond team took this on. Um, it's important to not only better understand perceptions and misperceptions among the key corporate executives, but really to establish benchmarks against which to measure future marketing programs. In this particular case, um, we're also able to see how the region has moved the needle as this is an update to a study that we originally conducted in 2018, as Leslie mentioned. So while some of the questions remain the same, we did actually update some of the queries given the drastically different landscape now versus a few years ago. So let me give you a sense of the methodology. Um, and you can pop to that next slide. There we go. Thanks, Jen. So in terms of methodology, we conducted the survey in February of 2021, and we um, and it was online. Um, we conducted, um, we asked corporate executives as well as their advisors, and we had a really strong response rate. So 154 responses were received, of which 92 were C-suite executives and 62 were site selection consultants. In this year's survey, a key question was understanding how geographies are impacting location decisions. So when asked about the location of their headquarters um, of the respondents, um, we found that 80% were located in a major urban area and 50% of them had a California presence. More than a third of those are planning on moving their facilities out of California, largely in search of more favorable costs and operating structures. So just want to give you a sense of who we asked. And then I'll just sort of um, want to start with this question. And um, Jen, if you if you jump to that uh, next one, there is, um, I think all of us have seen sort of anecdotal evidence and also certainly what we've been hearing in the media. But we know that mid-tier cities are really having a moment. Um, I just wanted to get, dig into this one question with you real quickly. We asked the respondents, 
what are the three, um, what are the top three mid-tier areas or regions that are on your radar for new business locations or expansions? And here you see these uh, represent uh, the top eight, and these eight are the top of mind mid-tier cities among corporate executives. You know, many of these we know are competitor, considered competitor set of, um, of Richmond. And certainly our go ultimate goal is to have Richmond on this list, but I just wanted to give you a sense there of um, some of the top um, locations on the minds of these corporate executives. Okay, so let's just dive a little deeper into the region according to both corporate executives and site selectors. So when we do this type of research, it's important to get input from both respondents who have firsthand experience with the location, as well as those who are basing their responses really just on perception. So in this particular case, we found that 81% of site selectors had previously considered the Richmond region for their clients. Of those, 40 had included Richmond on an initial screen, while 41% that Richmond um, actually made it to the short list. So that's their familiarity as they respond to this survey. And then meanwhile, you see that only 10% of corporate executives reported that they had considered the region for a relocation project. So sort of keep that in mind as we pop through these. So one of the questions that we asked, um, and you can, if you jump to that next one there, Jen, one of the questions that we asked is um, what we like to call a did you know question. So you see some of these different um, business assets and lifestyle assets and business assets that certainly are true to the Richmond region. Um, we only ask this question of corporate executives. And here you see, um, you know, their limited knowledge of some of Richmond's assets and strengths, you know, indicate to us that there's a lot of opportunity for additional messaging and education on the region's business climate and assets. So you'll see there, you know, did they know? And then um, you see, of course, in the red, um, yes, they knew it or they did not know it. So sort of keep that in mind and, and an interesting um, point for further discussion, perhaps. Then we also ask a question in these surveys, we'd like to know, um, you know, what industries do the corporate executives um, attribute to the region? So here we asked both, actually we asked both site consultants and corporate executives, and you see um, there in the red and the gray differentiating, differentiating that. Note that it's not uncommon for great, to see greater familiarity on the part of the site selectors. It's really their job, and Chris, Chris can speak to this, but it's really their job to be familiar with the region's assets and its challenges. What we do see here though, is there is a limited familiarity with the depth and the breadth of the region's industry concentrations among corporate executives there that's in the gray. Um, based on perception studies that we've done for other clients, the percentage that have associations with these sectors is pretty low, is a little bit low. Um, there's a greater association certainly with those top three, as you can see. Um, but what we'd love to see um, is Richmond, Richmond better associated with some of the industries like advanced manufacturing, IT, supply chain. So there's some work to be done in terms of um, really bundling those industries and doing a little bit more education to specifically to corporate executives. Then we, want, we wanted to take a look also at the likelihood that the region would be considered for future projects. Um, and again, we see a high likelihood that site selectors will consider the region in the future. So that is great, um, but it does drop drastically among corporate executives. And we'll see in a minute um, that the likelihood of considering the Richmond area has actually dropped over time among corporate executive audience. But here you see that you do continue to fall um, below several of your competitors. Now, granted, we did set this competitor set um, fairly high. The bar is high. You see some of um, those mid-tier cities that come up top of mind, and that's really what we're considering your competitive set. So um, that Richmond does lie, let's see, Richmond is you know above so that Virginia Beach and the Washington DC area. Um, but sort of note there where, they, where you all stand there. And then we'll take a look here. Um, so this is comparing data between 2018 and 2021. And as I mentioned, while you've lost ground among corporate executives over the last three years, site selectors report um, a slight increased likelihood of considering the region compared to 2018. 
So again, it's you know really the consultant's job to be familiar with industry concentrations and different assets of your region, but corporate executives don't have that same level of knowledge. Um, we do know from a report that we do called Winning Strategies, we um, do a study of corporate executives every three years, we know that dialogue with industry peers, as well as articles in newspapers and magazines, are important ways to reach the audience. Um, so testimonials and getting your message out in front of this corporate executive audience is really gonna be important to help gain ground, particularly among your competitive set. So let's take a look at that competitive set from the perspective of both the audiences and over time. Um, so here you see Richmond has a strong showing among site selectors, as we mentioned, but there are other locations that are perceived, you know, a little bit more favorably, um, and they've also gained, gained ground since 2018. So I know there's a, a lot of numbers there, but, um, you know, in the red, the 2021, and in the gray, um, you've got your 2018 numbers. Um, as I mentioned before, that DC region really was the only one to see perceptions decline. But as most of these locations, your competitive set, are really those mid-size, mid-tier cities that you know, are kind of having their moment, uh, it's not surprising to see them gaining ground based on what we've seen in terms of how different geographic areas are perceived um, really in light of the pandemic. So as we've been seeing all along, um, well, um, I wanted to show you this, perceptions among corporate executives here are significantly lower. Um, and you've lost, actually lost ground since 2018. We can see that's been the case with several of the other competitor locations, um, but they've declined in perceptions at a bit of a lesser degree. You know, again, reinforcing um, some of the same themes that we've seen over this um, last couple of, of uh, data points. So a little bit of work to be done among those corporate executives. Um, and certainly that's why we are here today to talk a little bit about marketing, uh, uh, marketing of uh, Richmond. And then just the last two slides that I wanted to share with you, the two questions. Um, we had asked an open-ended question. And the question was, you know, what are the top three perceived strengths of Richmond? So you see there at the bottom in 2018, the results are at the bottom. And then here in 2020 um, on the top. What struck us here was that the perceived strengths, and certainly, you know, the larger the word, the more often that strength was noted. Um, but the perceived strengths here are extremely consistent from 2018 to 2021. So you see location coming in quite strong, um, you know, really that your region's mid-Atlantic East Coast location is really considered a key asset. And then you also see the quality of workforce, which is um, really important. And I know we'll talk a little bit about talent here as we go along, but um, workforce is, is a perceived strength as is location. So you're, you're starting off in a, in a great spot there. Um, however, if you take a, a, a look at this last slide here, some key takeaways as we look at the weaknesses, um, there continues to be a lack of identity for the region or really, um, you know, really no brand or a strong image. Um, similar, it's very interesting that that is largely how was the case in 2018 and continues to be the case in 2021. This is certainly fixable but it will require some resources, you know, to address that lack of information or the knowledge about the region. So um, we need to sort of talk through about how to help, you know, really build out a brand for Richmond. So those are um, sort of 13 slides there to start off the discussion today. And Leslie, I will hand it back to you. Well, thank you, Jolene. I think that's a really good basis um, for which us to start, for which we can start this discussion. So I'm gonna come right back to you, Julie. What do you think the biggest surprises or takeaways are for you and how can these communities influence perception? Sure. Um, you know, I think the surprise is, um, you know, as you everyone here on the phone, you know, there's such great, um, such champions around here um, for Richmond. And there's so many different assets that Richmond brings to the table, both on the business front and also lifestyle front. So I think what surprises me is just that lack of knowledge among corporate executives. And so um, there's just not, um, it's surprising that as much as um, Richmond is so strong in so many ways that there's really, you're really starting off with a blank slate 
as it comes to corporate relates to corporate executives. It's not an overly negative thing, by the way. I mean, you're not starting in the hole, you're not in a hole, but it rather gives you an opportunity to really market forward. So really package up your industries, talk about your key messages and get them out into the marketing channels that are read or viewed by those corporate executive audience. Yeah, Leslie, I, I would just add, this is kind of a, it's actually a big challenge for Virginia as well. So both for the Commonwealth and for the Richmond region, and really for almost every region of the Commonwealth of Virginia, we have really underinvested in marketing efforts compared to our competitors. I mean, when you look at what places like Texas and Florida and North Carolina and Georgia are doing, it's multiples uh, of what we're doing here. And while Virginia and the Richmond region have a lot of great strengths, those strengths are not as well known by corporate executives and site consultants as are the strengths of many of those top competitor markets as I think Julie and, and um, DCI's research showed. And I'll add, if I might, Leslie, I think you used a key word there and that was perception. Uh, and if you look at the difference between the way the site selectors perceive the, the community and the way corporate executives perceive the community, a lot of that's driven by how they approach things. Uh, and that is site selectors perceive are very data-driven. Uh, and whereas corporate executives are very perception driven. Right. And essentially what's happening is we're winning the war on the objective factors. And that's true for Virginia as well. I think Stephen would agree is that if you look at surveys of business climate or other issues where they're judging people based on workforce, logistics, cost of doing business, regulatory perspective, the Richmond area and Virginia as a whole comes out very hot. Uh, but if you then look at what corporate executives are influenced by, and that is word of mouth, perception or whatever, unfortunately, we're losing that war. Uh, and that's where we've got to close the gap. Yeah. So Chris, following up on that, so what, what is it the GRP can do to increase that consideration even more among the consultants? Uh, that's a very interesting question. Um, uh, a, few, a few general thoughts. One is, um, my view is you can't invest enough in your website. You know, the, 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 the website for the regional partnership is your front door to the world. It really is. I mean, there are people looking at this region 24 seven when they're traveling or when they get back to traveling, um, you know, but it, corporate executives, site selectors and others, and they're gonna be using that as a resource to get to the communities, to learn more about the communities, to learn more about the region. They're looking for data uh, so that they can do that objective analysis uh, of communities. Second, um, a pet peeve of many site selectors, and I'm not saying the Richmond region does this um, poorly, but uh, when we are asking for information, answer the questions. <laughs> answer the questions that we're given and be thorough uh, in responding to the questions. Stephen pointed to marketing. Uh, the, the, the final point that I've got here is, you know, the, the site selection world is very much an echo chamber. And that is you really just need one or two people who are gonna be champions for this region. And we all, I mean, as um, Jennifer noted in my, uh, intro, you know, I'm part of the Site Selectors Guild, you just need a few corporate executives, a few site selectors who are really high on Richmond, and they're going to talk about that among all their colleagues. Uh, and and finding those champions is going to be key. And so to follow up on that, is it really more about site elimination as much as it is about site selection? Uh, that's, that's part of the process for sure, uh, is you want to make sure that you're not a, a site that's eliminated. Um, and, and again, a lot of that is the data-driven uh, um, uh, issues that we talked about earlier. Uh, but, you know, there's also um, the, the final point that Julie made was there's just a, a lack of identity for the Richmond region. Uh, a story I'll give is we were doing a project a couple of years ago for a client, um, and it was, it was Atlanta versus Nashville. And all the objective factors lined up for Atlanta, every single one of them. Uh, but there was a perception that Nashville for that client was a growing up and coming community. And there was a perception, particularly for the industry, for this client, that Nashville was the place you had to be, even if all the objective factors did not line up. It was a perception issue. And Richmond needs to shape its identity of what it wants to be. Are we going to try to be all things to all people? Or are we going to be that we're going to say we're going to really double down on corporate services, professional services, and some of those uh, areas we talked about earlier? And I'm sure Stephen and Julie have some additional perspective on that. Well, I'll, I'll segue over to Stephen. Stephen, some are, what are some of the ways that we can let corporate executives know more about the region's advantages for business? Well, I think, I think Leslie, the, the first thing I would say is we really have to start by acknowledging what our position is in the marketplace and, and really building off of Chris's points, the, the fundamentals of the market are really outstanding. I mean, the quality of life, the available 
educational institutions at all levels, the weather, the proximity to lots of other great amenities. This is a wonderful place to live, a great place to do business. But when you look at just a straight question, there was a great question DCI had early in the survey, which is an open-ended question. I think it was basically, what are the top mid-sized metros in the US? You know, Richmond area does not show up in that list. Neither do any other mid-sized metros in Virginia, by the way. When I think about the greater Richmond region, I've lived here now for just over four years, I think of it as very much like an undervalued stock, basically. The, the quality, the fundamentals are outstanding. But when you think about it, uh, if, if someone were to have a sentence that included the words uh, Raleigh, Austin, Nashville, the Richmond area should be in that sentence, right? But it's not typically today. Um, there's a couple big, there's a number of big reasons for that. I would actually argue the biggest one is just a lack of marketing at both the regional level and the state level. Let's don't forget Virginia for years, uh, and I forget how far back it went, but several years ago, zeroed out its marketing budget for economic development. We only marketed Virginia for tourism. We did a great job of that, but we didn't market Virginia for business. We've only recently started that back in the last couple of years and really at a relatively modest level. When you look at the Greater Richmond Partnership, uh, compared to the aspirational regions, it is very small. I mean, it is very subscale compared to those leading regional economic development organizations, whether it's those in Nashville, Austin, Raleigh, or uh, Columbus and, and other mid-sized metros around the country. So part of the issue is we haven't really invested in economic development. We haven't invested in marketing the way that we need to. When you really look at those regions that have had great success, particularly those mid-sized metros, think about places like Austin, uh, the Research Triangle Park area, uh, Nashville, they've had large, well-funded regional economic development efforts for decades, typically with a combination of both public and private sector investments and primarily private sector, actually. You know, the Richmond region actually does pretty well, I think, and uh, uh, Jen may correct me if I'm wrong, but I think does fairly well in terms of the public sector investment. Private sector is, is kind of really under market. I'll give you just one example. And Jen, please correct me if I state this wrong, but I used to run the regional economic development organization in the Baton Rouge area, much smaller market uh, than the Richmond region. We had, uh, by the time I left, we had uh, 30 investors, 30 private sector investors that each contributed $50,000 a year or more, 30, right? I think that number for Richmond, I believe is one, Jen, if I'm not mistaken. We have a few more than that, yeah. A few more than that, but less, way less than 30 at any rate. And this is a market that's roughly twice the size, right, of the Baton Rouge area. And certainly Richmond should be competing in a much greater level than the Baton Rouge area. So I think it's a combination of not just marketing, but making sure that we have the resources to go into that. And I'll just add, we, we can do it. Think about the four cities that Stephen just named, Austin, Nashville, Raleigh, and Columbus. All of them have incredible, uh, remarkable alignment with Vir Richmond. They're all state capital towns. They're all diverse economies. They all have a major university presence. We've got that. We should be number five on that list. It's not like we are lacking anything other than just that perception. And that is a marketing story uh, as Stephen outlined. Well, and you know, I, I have to add on to that just from my perspective of sitting on the board of supervisors in Chesterfield. And what we see interestingly is our citizens somehow are getting this message almost better than our corporate executives. because. Mm -hmm we're finding, I mean, we have a growth, you know, of about one and a quarter percent. We have citizens, you know, now more than regionally just moving, but coming from outside the region because they're looking for a quality of life. They're looking for quality schools. They're looking for, you know, the diversity that Richmond, the Richmond area adds, all the amenities that we add. I mean, and so it seems like that message, there's an opportunity there for also for us to extrapolate that message out into our corporate executives because, you know, certainly they want to be located somewhere where their workforce wants to be, where it's an attractive and, um, and also, you know, economically viable marketplace to move families to. And so, you know, it seems like that needs to be an important piece of, you know, this communication because folks don't want to be looking for a market that isn't attractive to, to bring their workforce or to develop and expand a new workforce. And so, you know, I think there's some messaging there too that's really critically important. So, so let's just kind of move this into, you know, pushing this out to any and all of you. Um, who are some of the communities that, that are marketing themselves well and what, what is it they're doing differently than their peers? Yeah, yeah. You know, I'll, I'll jump in on this one and um, I, 
we could probably go all day here to sort of going back and forth on different communities around the country and everybody's got their um, communities that hit their radar. I would say one that does well is Columbus and we can kind of think a little bit about, um, talk about this among the panelists, but you know, it really touches on everything that we're all saying here. Columbus has done a nice job from my perspective, Columbus, Ohio, um, really, really with a multi-layered marketing program. So they do, they have a public relations program. So you will see articles in newspapers about what Columbus is doing. Um, they also have a paid digital program. So they're sending out their message, you know, through a paid digital, it's landing on the radar of corporate executives in their key industries. That paid digital then is driving them to the website that is you know, set up for SEO and it has industry pages um, you know, really built out. They've, um, I know that they have a content hub. So it, it is a lot of work to make Columbus come to mind in terms of why I would say that they are one of the um, communities doing it well. And um, I don't know what their marketing budget is, but I know it's significant. And they have really rallied the corporate executives in their community to tell, to have testimonials and sort of know what that Columbus story is. So Columbus sits my radar because I just like that it's so multi-pronged in terms of their, um, their approach to marketing and telling their story. And I'd be curious if my fellow panelists agree. <laughs> I was going to say, I, I would add to Julie's point. Uh, you know, I would say while Columbus, I completely agree with everything Julie said about Columbus. They have one of the very best, if not the best, regional economic development organization in the country. What's the biggest difference between the Columbus Regional Economic Development Organization and GRP uh, is Columbus has a budget almost four times what okay, GRP yeah. is, literally. I mean, last time I checked, it was 7.7 .7 million per year versus I think about 2.1 or so, Jen, for the greater Richmond area. So, I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's night and day. Right. And keep in mind, right, the product that we have to sell in RVA is so much better. I mean, I don't want to take anything away from Columbus. It's a nice town. Sure. Yeah, it's there. But um, to me, the market, the product that we have is so much better, but they have a much more robust engine to sell that <clears throat> market with. And I don't want to over over make the point on resources, but I do think it's a really, really important to make important point to make. It's really hard to find a thriving mid-sized metro that doesn't also have a really robust regional economic development organization with strong engagement of both the private sector and the public sector. And the only community that I'd throw in the mix that we haven't named earlier would be Kansas City. And you mm -hmm. look at the Kansas area, Kansas City Area Development Council does, mm -hmm. and they not only, I think, check off all the boxes that Julie and Stephen have talked about, but they've also doubled down with a specific initiative around logistics, the whole Kansas right. City Smart Port Initiative and what they run there. Again, something that Richmond uh, very much could do when you look at logistics costs and location. You know, we have uh, just as many positive attributes, if not more, than Kansas City. Um, and, and really could tell that story. And they've decided to make a huge um, uh, push into that logistics chain. Uh, the two other things that I would, well, three other things that I talk about is, um, and I'm sure Stephen, you would have some thoughts about the whole talent and building a, a, mar a marketing plan around talent. Uh, and that's, you know, retaining the talent that you already have. Um, and of course that goes to the campus RVA effort that uh, is already starting to, to be here. You know, look at all the college students that come to this community. We need to make sure to attract, uh, retain those people, attracting new people. Uh, but also then a point Stephen made was about making sure, and I know Jennifer's thinking about this and talking to Jack Barry about how to make sure it happens even more, is alignment with the tourism mm -hmm. message. You know, we're spending millions of dollars to promote people to come and visit Virginia. We need to make sure that, you know, our marketing message from an economic development perspective mirrors that because we're already, you know, as Stephen said, you know, the Virginians for lovers, marketing goes far in promoting the state. You know, now BDP is trying to figure out, well, how do we leverage off of that? I think the opportunity exists for the Richmond region as well. I think that's great. And I'll just throw in, um, I don't know if everyone has seen, but Vermont has done an interesting job with um, partnering their economic development group with their tourism. And they had that stay to stay in Vermont. So I'm um, not sure if everyone's familiar with that, but you know, really resources put in both from the economic development side, the tourism side with the thought, which supports a lot of studies that says, hey, if you come visit here, you might wanna live here. So um, there are studies that say, you know, today's visitor is tomorrow's talent. And so if you can get people to come visit your state and your community, they often will say, hey, you know what, I could see myself living here. And now with the rise of remote workers, you've got great opportunity for people to live and work um, either remotely or, um, or otherwise. So just to, to sort of support Chris's comments there, talent and the, the partnering between economic development groups and tourism you know, we're really seeing that across the country, um, you know, come to really a great place of collaboration and, and pooling of resources. You know, it's expensive, like we all just said, to tell your story and get that, um, that Richmond story out there. 
Okay, moving on, Jennifer, um, what kind of questions have we got from those involved? Sure, the first one um, comes from, what do we do when both workforce and location show up as both a strength and a weakness? I'll speak to that just in, in terms of our study. So we see that a lot, actually. So we often, we do dozens and dozens of perception surveys like this. So a couple of things to keep in mind. One, it's perception. Um, and two, it really depends then on the perspective of the person saying it. So if um, location can come up as a strength and it can come up on a weakness, and we see that in a lot of different places. And the reason for that is if it's a corporate executive and you know, Chris and Steven can certainly speak to that too. If it's a corporate executive looking for um, a facility on the um, East Coast, Richmond's going to come up probably very quite high. You know, so location is an asset. Hey, I want to have my supply chain because you know my um, location there because of certain supply chain uh, metrics. But if they are doing business on the West Coast and that's where their whole business is, they're going to mark, hey, that's a weakness for me. You know, that's not a location that I need. So it really depends on the perspective of the person responding. And similar to talent. Um, you know, it depends on the kind of talent and, and workforce that they're looking for. So our goal, our recommendation is always, hey, if it is a strength, let's figure out how to package, um, you know, if it comes up high as a strength, let's package it and let's get um, the location assets in front of corporate executives, knowing that many of them see it as a strength. And I don't know if- uh, I would just I add on Julie's comment that I do think it's very common in the same market that people would say workforce is both a strength and a weakness. Right. Um, the other thing I would say is that it, it has become, if you look over the last decade, you know, workforce has always been really important, but it has become the dominant driver. It's not the only thing that matters, but it's probably the easily the most important factor in the vast majority of site selection uh, decisions. And it's not just you know scale, it's quality, and it's also cost uh, as well. But I do think objectively, this region performs very, very well on town. I mean, look at the success of companies like CoStar and Capital One and others that have grown so much over the last decade or so, or even last several years, I guess, in the case of CoStar, I think that's a real testament to the strength of the market. But we, we always also have to keep in mind that um, there has been an increasing bias toward larger uh, markets. So the imperative for growth, I think, is really, really important. I think one of the things when I think about the future of RVA in this region is that we don't just need to market ourselves, you know, to, to move up rankings. I mean, we need more economic opportunity and we need more growth overall, because in general, the, the most successful regions in the world right now are the bigger ones. And um, this region is, is just kind of barely at the scale to be among that larger group, uh, but we need to make sure that we stay there. And I think that means getting more growth than we've had in the last few years. Awesome. Here is uh, an interesting question. Um, Richmond seems to be going through a narrative change uh, and our cultural brand is in fluxation. Does that help us as an opportunity to stand out for executives that are looking for a market that align with their values as a company? I think that's certainly the case, Jennifer. That's, I think, a very astute observation uh, in that, you know, we aren't marketing ourselves as you know, sometimes people joke about Florida, it's sun, sand, and shamu. Um, and, you know, and Virginia, it's, you know, our story has always been history, history, history. And, you know, I'm a history buff. I love history. But, you know, that's maybe, you know, there's, there's some great parts of Virginia history and there's some very ugly parts uh, of Virginia history. And I think that narrative is changing and has to change. Um, and I think uh, probably many people in this call probably saw, um, the, the article in the Wall Street Journal recently that talked about the, 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 how Atlanta and other communities are positioning themselves and using the diversity of the workforce that they have uh, and how they're aligning that to attract uh, top, top companies as well as uh, talent, um, and particularly in the tech sector, is that people are using their diversity and using the, the change in the, the perception of that community as a real strength. You know, Atlanta made that decision many decades, decades ago. You know, Atlanta, the, the city that's too busy to hate. I mean, you know, that's been a 50 year initiative. Think about it, 50 year initiative by Atlanta to turn that perception around. Um, you know, you think about, um, you know, those of you who are Richmond natives on this call, remember, you know, the, you know, the three R's in North Carolina, reading, writing and the road to Richmond. And, you know, that's, that's not the case for Raleigh anymore. Uh, you know, they really turned that perception around. Um, and, and that is a multi-decades initiative. You know, it's not something that we're gonna snap our fingers uh, and make change. And it doesn't mean we abandon some of our traditions that we all hold dear, 
uh, but again, the world is changing, uh, and I think we have a really unique opportunity to seize uh, this opportunity to, to tell the full uh, Richmond story, which is built on talent, which is built on a good place to do business, a great place to live, a great quality of life, and some of the other uh, attributes that Julie uh, uncovered uh, during her analysis. Yeah, that's great. And I would just add to that, Chris, and you've seen these perception surveys. We do a lot of surveys of talent and where millennials and where talent want to live. And um, over the course of the last you know, year, um, diversity has come up, you know, and you said in the tech sector, and I would say, I think in growing in, in sectors across the industry, across the world, um, that diversity of lifestyle and um, and um, and, and people obviously in cultures is a real strength. And I think Richmond has that. I mean, what a deep, wonderful history you have. Like you said, it's got some, you know, some ugly sides to it, but frankly, most cities in the, in the country do. So how do you sort of tell your story um, in a way that is authentic and real, but also showcases your great diversity and rich history? I think that's a great question. Awesome. So um, someone sent a message uh, to me separately, just asking about, do we have any insights into not just overall budget, but how much some of these other communities are spending from a marketing perspective. Um, and I will leave this to the panel, but I have some insight on that as well. Right. <laughs> I feel like you've done the best research on that particular. She's got company. good research. <laughs> yeah, I, know, I know a lot about the total budgets, but I don't know the exact, uh, what I do know is it tends to be a pretty significant part of those regional EDO budgets because it's a big part of their mission. Um, but I think I'm guessing you'd have the best data of anybody on the, on the line here right now. Um, sure. So, um, one DCI hosts a summit annually for, you know, top marketing executives, uh, across the U S and each year, Julie, um, you have asked, you know, questions that people respond to anonymously. Mm -hmm. Right. And, um, over the last several years, what we've seen is we see the same people that attend the DCI marketing summits, right? It, there's a few people that change out, but for the most part, it's pretty much the right. same. Correct. So it yeah. doesn't mean that some people's budgets are just much larger than others. What it means is that these budgets are actually increasing substantially, right? And um, I think the last one from 2019, or was it the 2020? 19. No, it was 2020, because I think you did a virtual one, right? Oh, right. virtual, yes. I'm and sorry. so yeah, it right. was over 40% of the attendees had a budget, a marketing budget, specifically over $500,000. Now for comparison, uh, the Greater Richmond Partnership has a 2.1 overall budget and just under 10% of that uh, is toward marketing at the moment. Uh, in comparison, when I was in Orlando, I had a $3 million marketing budget um, of that, so larger than the entire organization. Um, of that, I had a direct campaign where I was, right? So there was campaign money and then there was overall marketing money you know, for the organization. And we were spending 1.5 annually per year, plus an additional 1 million of in-kind. Um, I have done research with many different organizations. Phoenix is also near that level. Um, today, they're spending about 600,000. Um, and that's not off base from, some, from several of the larger entities. Now, Columbus, I can't pull that information out of them. Um, but there are also some of the entities across the US that are regional in nature that have some kind of a, um, a match sometimes uh, from their state. So for instance, in Florida, we could apply for, for grant funding from the state economic development organization. So, yeah. Good question. Yeah, I don't have, um, I'll just sort of, I, I will speak to one entity that I think is doing it well that the way they group their money is Cincinnati. So they want something called Experience Cincinnati. It's funded by the EDC, the chamber, the CVB, as well as private sector. And so um, really interesting approach because as everything we're talking about here, marketing is expensive, but it also is what moves that needle and helps attract additional corporate investment, attracts talent, really tells and shapes that story. So um, yes, Mar um, you know, some of these entities certainly, like you said, Jen, uh, we do a survey and we're seeing budgets, you know, 500,000, a million, 2 million. Um, so they're, they are significant. And I'll add, Stephen, so you don't have to, but this is an issue you and I have talked about. And you look at how much money Texas pours into economic development, right. particularly at the local level. And there's one reason for that, dedicated source of revenue for economic development in that Texas several decades ago allowed their localities to adopt a quarter or a half cent taxation, a sales tax that is funding for, for economic development projects. And when you look at the economic development entities around the country that are well-funded, it's Texas. And it's those communities like Texas and other places that have, uh, you look at Ohio, 
they saw the reason Columbus uh, and Jobs Ohio are able to have so much money is because the state sold the liquor license uh, and uses it to fund economic development. You look at other states which use their lottery proceeds uh, or casino revenues uh, for economic development. A dedicated source of funding for economic development is something Virginia needs to look at at a statewide and a regional level. Yeah, I, I, I really agree with Chris. That's a big part of the Texas juggernaut. You can't deny it. You just can't. I tried to do a reaction, but as the host, I guess I, I can't, I don't have that option there. I was going to do a clapping. Um, <laughs> so here's a new question that just came in. Um, if access to workforce is a key driver for corporate decisions, how does Richmond's population come into play? Of the metros that were mentioned today, we have 20% of Atlanta's, 50% of Columbus's, and 66% of Nashville's. Chris, you might be the best person to, to kick that off. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, yeah, we are a little bit, we're, we're a little bit smaller than some of those metro areas. Um, but, you know, again, I think, you know, that goes to the one point I'll make is I think we do about the point of building a brand identity. And that is, yes, while we may be smaller than Atlanta or smaller than a, than a Nashville or whatever, um, if we double down on, we're going to say we're going to really go all in on industry A, B, and C, uh, particularly those where we have a competitive advantage or strength, I think we sh would show that we punch above our weight. Uh, so while maybe our workforce may be a little bit smaller, if you look at our professional services core or our corporate headquarters core or in van in manufacturing, we may be you know, uh, aligning with some of those other communities. The second way to augment that, and I'll just go ahead and mention it here, is you know there's there's a lot of discussion going on with regards to how do we uh, amplify our message by um, working in cooperation with Hampton Roads, this whole RVA 757 Connects initiative. Uh, to to and and you know the main reason for that is to make us look bigger than we are. Uh, you look at the number of people that commute back and forth, uh, uh, or or live in the middle and, and commute to each market. Uh, if we you know if we talk about how the and you know you think about all the assets about how codependent Richmond and Hampton Roads are on each other, from the port and the logistics and the defense sector and everything else. In many ways, we are becoming one workforce area. And I'm not talking about a merger. I'm not talking about merging MSAs. That's not what I'm talking about at all. Uh, but if we can shape some of those perceptions to say you take a, you know, a 40th place market and a 38th place market and you merge them together, we're the 17th largest workforce market in the country. Um, and I think if we can use those kind of assets to make us look bigger than we are, again, uh, pointing to those areas where we are strong and then, you know, whatever we can do to cooperate with uh, either Hampton Roads or, you know, there's also the Greater Washington Partnership. If there are opportunities for us to work together with that group, which has been very inclusive of the Richmond region, uh, we can again make us look bigger than we are. And Chris, I would also add, I, I believe that we would have, at least for many occupations, a cost advantage over Atlanta and Nashville, maybe not as much Columbus, but I think we have a kind of quality of life and, and amenities advantage over them. So that is another thing that comes into play. Yes, sir. And I, I would just add that, yes, a lot of the um, populations are higher, some of these different competitor cities that we said, but size does not matter in terms of positioning yourself as a great place to live. And, and frankly, some of those smaller communities, you know, what we're seeing out, coming out of the pandemic is a lot of people want to live, you know, in a, in a much less dense population that um, dense city than maybe what has been historically true. So it's a real advantage. I think your population size is great, but it really is just a matter of picking your story um, and telling your story to an audience that will either make an investment or make a move. So I would say size should not deter you from um, really positioning yourself well. Yeah, and, and building on Julie's point as well, we've actually recruited a few people from Atlanta to VDP for our team. And one of the things they rave about is the, the lack of traffic. I know right. maybe some folks in Richmond complain about traffic, but compared to Atlanta, it's an oasis. Right. <laughs> and uh, they really have enjoyed uh, the quality of life here very much. I think the other thing is that for a market our size, the diversity of housing types and neighborhoods is really, really remarkable. We really give people a lot of great options to choose from. I would just build on that uh, transportation comment. When we did the HQ2 proposal, uh, I dug through the Texas Transportation Institute's urban mobility report. And not just do we not have any traffic, we are literally the least congested large city in the country. Um, and in comparison to um, one of the most, um, which is not too far away. Um, okay, so two, two others, um, some questions that just came in. If you could share one message about Richmond with corporate executives, what would it be? And what do you wish they knew? 
I mean, my one message would be when you think about where um, Nashville, Raleigh, and Austin are today, uh, that in our own way, that's the future of this region. And why not get in early? Without the traffic of those three areas, if any of you've been to, if you've any been to Austin or Nashville lately, it's getting really, really bad. Um, I, I would say, um, obviously, I'm not. I don't live in Richmond. I'm not in Richmond. But based on perception surveys that we do, um, you know, corporate executives and talent cost is, you know, cost comes up high in terms of priority, and then for corporate executives talent comes up high in terms of priority. You have both. You have a great cost of, you know, cost factor when it comes to the value of, of living there. And then you also have great talent that I don't think is being, um, you know, sort of marketed well. And so I would really emphasize your cost factor and then your access to talent. Wonderful. All right. And then I think um, with this may be our last question. Um, as a region of counties and a city, uh, we have Chamber RVA, of course, Richmond Region Tourism uh, and the Greater Richmond Partnership. Is there one entity that should take the lead in rebranding? The question is who takes the lead in rebranding? Um, and I would ask this of our panelists, but I would just also share that I think it's a very much a collaborative effort. There is no one entity that owns the brand of any region. I'll go ahead, I don't know that it matters. Uh, just as long as there's alignment, to be honest, and there's consistency. Uh, I've seen, um, you know, you look at the various models around the country. Nashville has a chamber-led uh, organization. Columbus has a ec regional economic development-led organization. I mean, you see different models and people make it work. Uh, but what makes it work is the, is the funding, is the commitment to make it work, uh, and that everybody's bought in from top to bottom. That's what matters. That, that's exactly right. And I would just say that's exactly right. It doesn't matter who takes the lead, but there does need to be communication among uh, organizations and a consistency of message. The, the worst thing you can do is have some sort of, um, you know, conflict between organizations and one just says, I'm just going to do it our way. And another says, I'm going to do it our way. You're wasting resources, right? So you're really trying to tell two different sorts of messages. Um, but if you can collaborate, come together, share resources, if not even resources, at least ideas and have a family of branding, you know, with branding that's within the same family. And so um, of messaging of, you know, you can have different colors, you can have slightly different ways that you say it. But if you, if someone can take the lead and there can be collaboration among the organizations that's really going to advance um, the entire region. Awesome, that's wonderful. Um, well, Leslie, that are those are all the questions that we have for now. Well, might I just add to that too, that I'm just really excited. I think we are in a place where we've got three organizations, three fabulously run organizations between the Chamber, Richmond Regional Tourism and GRP that you know, are sitting at the table having these collaborative conversations. And what's really exciting about that is that we have the same goals, but we bring different talents and different perspectives to the table. And I think that the collaboration of not only the minds and the energies, but the financial dollars, because the messaging, while it may have different tweaks, is all still about, you know, elevating the region and messaging, you know, what a great and fabulous place it is to be. And, you know, I just have to say, when you look at from, again, from the citizen perspective, from the workforce perspective of people wanting to be here, we have so many incredible amenities when we go through this list where we stand out top and foremost. And so I think that's you know our challenge now is to really send that message and really share that message you know, on a greater platform and looking for funding. So, so I wanna thank everybody for participating with us today, not just our panelists who are fabulous and always committed, and enjoy the conversation, but all of our participants as well. We really hope you enjoyed the program and you know, look forward to our next investor forum that will be held um, in May. So thanks for joining us. I hope you all have a great day and thanks for Jennifer and the staff as well.